first speaker is Will uh, Durham from uh, Stanford University. Uh, he is Bing Professor in Human Biology and Young and Yamazaki University Fellow in the Department of uh, uh, Anthropology there. Uh, his 1991 book, uh, Coevolution, Genes, Cultural and Human Diversity, has won the MacArthur Prize Fellowship and has been called one of the most important works of theory ever written by an anthropologist. Uh, he's a founder of the co-evolutionary approach to human diversity, uh, regarding genes and culture as two parallel but distinct forms of information, inheritance in human populations. And those who were there yesterday afternoon and listened to his short uh, <coughs> intervention about the Amazon and, and sacrificial practices there, uh, can imagine that uh, we are heading for a very interesting talk uh, entitled Coevolution and Mimesis, Heading Off a Mimetic Crisis. Will, please. Thank you, Harold. And thanks to the organizers and to all of you for uh, this wonderful, I think, very, very educational and very uh, moving uh, symposium. It's only too fitting that we're here gathered uh, paying tribute with a symposium to Darwin. I uh, had 150 years and counting the resounding confirmation of the theoretical foundations laid in 1859, plus new gains for evolution in anthropology and in other fields. Uh, in my discipline, anthropology, we're seeing especially um, in new advances in what I'll call evolutionary culture theory, including Professor Girard, um, where there's progress toward Darwinian or variational theory of cultural evolution. And of course, it's fitting also to pay uh, tribute here with a symposium to René Girard, one of the most encompassing theories ever proposed in the human sciences, a general theory, a very general theory of cultural evolution with diverse supporting evidence from religion, myth, and ritual. Sometimes it's too easy for us to talk about theory, and what I like to do is to you know, make theory hit the road and talk about real examples. Yesterday, I gave you um, an example and um, I'd like to start today with just uh, some, some few images from that case. But let me say at the outset that there are features of Girard's theory that I find uh, very compelling. The ubiquity and efficacy of imitation in humans, uh, I think all the evidence, uh, some of which was reviewed yesterday very nicely for us by Scott, uh, just confirms resoundingly the ubiquity and efficacy of imitation. Acquisitive mimesis, the imitative component of desire, I think is also just uh, the, the uh, dual mediation that we heard about this morning again. I think all of these things are just very important. And then I would say, depending on the context or environment, I find compelling mimetic rivalry, mimetic crisis, collective violence, surrogate deflection, ritualization. And yesterday and again today, I want to just show you some images about this work on the Tupian headhunters of uh, the Amazon. Uh, that's an actual trophy head from the Munduruku, one of the Tupian populations I talked about which I feel is an especially convincing case, and I think we need cases in a symposium. I think you need an example to put some substance behind the, the theory. Prototopian emerged about 2,800 years ago, somewhere, right? Uh, we think from linguistic evidence and uh, archaeological evidence, somewhere in the dead center of the Amazon basin. It's a bigger uh, drainage basin, of course, for the Amazon River here. We speak of it as prototupi Waranian because it's, again, the common origin for a linguistic stock that rapidly differentiated. We uh, have archaeological evidence in a form of particular polychrome pottery that spreads to the uh, east down the seacoast and down, continuing down the seacoast and then back up some rivers and also in the west, it extends along rivers up into uh, Peru, Bolivia, and so on. Uh, this was a very successful adaptation, scaring away other people, as we talked yesterday. And here was the distribution of Tupian speakers um, about 1800, when the first kind of rough sketches were put together of where people resided. Tupinamba case, uh, a favorite for René Girard, uh, here and here. And you can see all the other Tupi speakers, Tupian speakers, all the way up into Peru, um, and again over here in Bolivia. So it's an amazingly um, effective and widespread adaptation. Uh, occasioned by this uh, headhunting tradition of inter-village warfare where the attackers would surprise at dawn. The shaman up here in the corner blows a sleep trance, uh, so they thought he's uh, basically listening for the call of a bird that signals that dawn is uh, half an hour away. They light firebrands and shoot them at the rooftops of these huts, which are supposed to break into fire. They always do this during the dry season, cause tremendous mayhem. Everybody goes running out in a panic, and they swoop in 
um, after they drop their uh, bows and arrows, they swoop in with head axes and um, made out of a very heavy wood. You can tell that the people they're attacking are also headhunters because they got their trophy heads right here at the front gate. Um, the central object of the raid was the taking of these heads. Here's another one. On the return, they were prepared in a very specific way. And um, what was really in important and interesting about this is, again, its meaningfulness that, that's closely linked to the religious beliefs. There's another point for Girard, especially to the supernatural spirit protectors. The most important deities were these spirit protectors who take care of the game animals in the Amazon. Trophy heads were said to exert a powerful charm over the spirit protectors who then increased the supply of game to Munduruku or other Tupians. So the trophy head itself appeases the protector and, and causes the protector to smile on the community that's been successful at getting one, and the magical power uh, contributed to the prestige and symbolic significance of the trophy takers and set up the mimetic rivalry that compelled young men to want to pursue the trophy heads. The game animals thereafter, these white-lipped peccaries, it's travel in enormous herds, 200 to 400, and move through the rainforest like a bulldozer, covering vast areas. They go straight until they hit an oxbow or a body of water. Sometimes they'll cross, but more often they'll deflect. And um, so they cover two, three kilometers per hour. Um, at Stanford, we always say if they're in Stanford today, they're in Berkeley tomorrow, um, that kind of distance. The uh, headhunter had the most important status, referred to as Dajbosi. The Dajbosi was literally the mother of the peccary, as I mentioned yesterday, the mother part of the term derived from the trophy head's power to attract and cause their numerical increase. This um, research, by the way, is done by Robert and Yolanda Murphy, based on um, informant accounts in the early 50s, recounting headhunting tradition as it existed prior to the 1930s and 40s when missionaries put an end to it. So it's not my overlay, it's their description, and it's my um, rather Girardian interpretation. Paradoxically, for such a seemingly masculine status, the um, headhunter symbolically filled a female role. And this is the collection of the headhunters in a particular village performing a ceremony. Uh, occasionally, a headhunter will be taken, will be ambushed in return by the other village, leaving a widow. And here, the, uh, the association of the headhunters, the successful Dajbosi, are pledging to take care and feed this woman, who is the widow of uh, a fallen warrior. So it's a very interesting and very complicated story. I can't go into all of it, but what's really interesting for our purposes is the ritualization and the ritual sacrifice. Here you can see the, uh, the ax that is used. Here's a captive taken in that process. Some heads are taken on spot and some captives are brought back. And here you can see a captive who's about to be uh, ritually sacrificed. Whether this is quite scapegoating in a Girardian sense or whether this is a deflection, I prefer to see this as a deflection. Uh, this uh, assures everybody that the deities are appeased, that the game will increase, that all the tensions and the pushing of the females to get the males out hunting, all of that falls into order. And so you can see that there is a, uh, a restoration. The mimetic crisis is resolved. Um, uh, whether it's scapegoating, it, because it's someone from another population, it's a little tricky in that case. It's not a member of us. Um, and uh, what's so interesting is that everywhere you go and these two Pian speakers, the ax has the same shape. There's always this kind of uh, fanfare deal with the feathers. Um, and so there is a lot of uh, cultural continuity. I see this as a worthy case for Girard, as mentioned yesterday. Two Pian violence and warfare fits the expected pattern. The course of mimetic rivalry over status within the villages promoted and rewarded violence toward outsiders. Raids and scapegoat victimization, uh, again, whether it should be deflection, I, I suspect that would be better terminology, worked to increase the supply of large game. And even today, Tupian villagers, so you walk into a village and go to see the uh, men's hut in the middle of the community. There will be many peccary and taper bones lined up along the walls, and they'll sit there and tell you that in the old days when they were allowed to headhunt, their game were much more available than they are today, um, so they still believe that this is the case. I found another interesting case, a case for Girard, in a most unexpected place, and I want to talk about that next. The evolution of adult lactose tolerance and intolerance. Now you say, my goodness. Milk is a long way from René Girard. Milk uh, brings up anything but the idea of conflict and rivalry. Um, but anyway, it turns out to be a fascinating case. This is the global distribution of lactose intolerance, shown as uh, red for intolerance and green for tolerance of the principal sugar 